Hello and welcome to video number two of paleoecology in which we are going to look at some of the basics of ecology. So if you're sitting comfortably, I will begin. So the first question we may want to think about if we're defining and thinking about ecology is how we can divide up the living world. Now the broadest category of the living world is a thing called the biosphere. That's the broadest ecological category that we can possibly make. And this is defined, as shown on the slide, as the whole of the region of the Earth's surface, the sea, and the air that is inhabited by living organisms. Okay, so um, that is a really broad definition. So to make our lives easier, we can divide the biosphere up into a, a series of hierarchical organizational units for want of a less abstract term. Um, starting at the smallest, the bottom, we could look at individuals, you, me, we're all individuals, right? We are individuals that contribute to populations. So a population is a collection of individuals of the same species somewhere in the world. But you can have multiple populations because of space. Things are spread out over the globe. If they're the same spe species, those populations, can be categorized at a higher level into the species to which they belong. So a species can have multiple different populations, which kind of makes sense. Species, multiple species, form communities. So species interact with each other and they form these communities of organisms. And multiple communities can interact within a space called a bi biogeographic province. And these are kind of like the biggest divisions of the biosphere. Each of these levels uh, occupies a specific volume of a thing that we can call ecospace. So ecospace is a notional space consisting of all of the environmental factors that impact on life. So that does include space space, so geography, but it will also include a series of conditions that impact upon the life of um, an organism, such as the temperature where they're living, the level of oxygen, the salinity if they're in water, everything that could impact on their ability to survive, we can think of as part of this eco space. So it's a many, um, many dimensional kind of notional idea, notional space. For example, we can say that communicate Communities, sorry, of numerous species occupy ecosystems within our eco space. So all of these communities interacting, um, sorry, each community, I should say, uh, occupies an ecosystem. So it's a community of different species. And species will occupy a space within that ecosystem that's called their niche. I'll get on to what that actually means in just a second. So I hope that's a useful overview of these spaces to you. And I, uh, you know, if we think about the um, definitions of some of the more important words that I've in just introduced you to, one of these is ecosystem. There's a definition on the slide for you here. This is a biological community and the physical environment associated with it. It's a very simple definition, but ecosystems themselves are actually really, really complex things. And this makes drawing even broad patterns challenging within ecosystems. The example on this slide is uh, an ecosystem in the Northwest Atlantic that was created, this diagram was created to try and understand the impact of cod fishing on this ecosystem. Every line on this diagram, which I had to flip by 90 degrees to fit on the slide, sorry about that, represents an interaction between two species. As you can see, ecosystems are really complicated things because many of these species will interact with many of the other species in this ecosystem. So yeah, it's complex. Can we break it down any further though? I mean, it's not useful to just say it's complicated and then give up. Well, yes, we can. So as I've said, the um, area of ecospace that any given species occupies, we can call a niche. And a niche is a little bit less complex. I'll give you a proper definition for a niche on the next slide. But let's first have an example to illustrate this, because I think that would be really useful. As an example, organisms have different ways of living, right? There are ecological distinctions between species regarding how they make their, their living, for example. Um, so how organisms 
get their energy and their organic material is one key ecological distinction we may want to make. Um, on the left hand side here, you can see a predator from the movie Predator. Uh, uh, yeah, that was original, wasn't it? Um, but these are things called heterotrophs. Now, heterotrophs are organisms that utilize organic matter that has been synthesized, made from scratch, by other organisms. We are heterotrophs, right? So I've actually given you a definition on this slide of what heterotrophic nutrition is. This is energy derived from the intake and digestion of organic substances, normally plant or animal tissues. The breakdown products of digestion are used to synthesize the organic material required by the organism. All animals obtain their food this way. Yeah, so animals are a heterotrophic group. In contrast to this, primary producers, which create their own organic material, um, are called autotrophs. So there's a definition of autotrophic nutrition on this slide, a type of nutrition in which organisms synthesize the organic materials they require for inorganic sources. So from inorganic sources, Chief sources of carbon and nitrogen are carbon dioxide and nitrates respectively. So an autotroph is a thing that makes its own energy. There are of course symbiotic relationships within the animals, um, such as within the corals, where um, there is a symbiotic relationship between the heterotrophic coral and the autotrophic algae that it includes within its colonies. So that uh, shows you that these things aren't always as cut as dry as, as we may like them to be. So uh, for an example of an autotroph, just think of any green plant. All green plants are autotrophic. They use light as a source of energy for synthesis. And this means that more specifically, we can say they are photoautotrophic. Yeah, so photo means they're using light to create their energy. That's true also of the cyanobacteria that I've got on the right hand side of this slide. Bear in mind that that's two divisions that we can easily make for macroscopic eukaryotes like you and me and plants. Um, but actually bacteria don't care for our definitions and there are loads of different ways that bacteria can be autotrophic. So other examples um, for, include chemoautotrophy. So these are bacteria which use energy that's been derived from chemical processes. So that's a thing called chemosynthesis. That's one kind of um, consider ecological consideration for an organism. So the ways by which something makes its energy is a key element um, of what we call this idea of a niche, which I will now introduce. So the ways that something makes its energy coupled with its tolerance to um, different environmental factors will provide a space within an ecosystem in which that species lives. And this is our definition of a niche. It's an abstract and often debated concept, but it essentially defines how a species interacts with its environment. I've put a definition on this slide for you here. So a niche is a summary of the conditions and resources that must be available in order for a species to maintain a population in the long term. A niche is therefore not a place, but a conceptual volume with numerous dimensions, including temperature, humidity and food supply each defined by the tolerable range for that species. So that is a working definition of what an ecological niche is for a species. But we can, I think, be a bit more precise than that if we want to be, if it's useful to us to be more um, specific. And you can see here a graph showing a range of different conditions. On the left-hand side, we've got a two-dimensional graph showing on the y-axis the salinity of a body of water, say, and on the x-axis, the temperature of that body of water. This allows us to map out with those two dimensions what we call a prospective niche. This is the region that's shown here in grey. And a prospective niche is the ecospace that could potentially be occupied by a species. Very rarely will we find a species that is actually occupying the full range of conditions under which it can survive. Often it won't be um, particularly happy under some of that range and so won't be very successful under that, um, under some conditions. This means that we've got this smaller volume of ecospace, which we can call the realized niche. This is the ecospace that a species will actually occupy. 
This is two-dimensional. If we add, for example, oxygen concentration of the water in which these are living, that's a three-dimensional um, representation of an ecological niche. And obviously we can take this up to as many dimensions as we like, depending on the um, kind of factors that influence the su success of the species. So that's what an ecological niche is. And a key question is, can two species coexist within a given niche? Well, there is actually a thing called the principle of competitive exclusion. And this states that two species competing for the same resource cannot exist. Okay, so if you have two species in exactly the same niche, the um, principle of competitive exclusion states that they one of those will eventually die out. Indeed, the uh, I guess the major assumption here is that which is better at getting a limiting resource will eventually eliminate the inferior competitor. And this is an intuitive idea that has been backed up by experimental work. The degree to which uh, it applies it remains debated in different areas. But nevertheless, I think it's a really interesting and useful idea for us to have when we're thinking about um, interactions in the real world. So in, uh, on the image on this slide, in A, you've got an example of competitive exclusion. Both rodent species here are consuming the same size seeds, but the blue species is consuming more of them. It's better at finding these seeds. There is a difference in competitive ability, therefore, and the blue species is going to ultimately wipe out the red species. And that, in essence, is competitive exclusion. Panel B shows coexistence. In this case, we've got some niche differences between species that are hindering competitive exclusion and helping to maintain species diversity. In this case, our two rodent species are depicted as consuming different size seeds. So the blue ones have bigger seeds than the red ones. This is an important niche difference and this allows their coexistence. So we could also think of this as if the stabilizing effects of a niche are stronger than the differences in competitive ability. If that's the case, species will coexist and diversity will be maintained. It's just another way of looking at the same thing. If you don't get that, try this. Think about two airlines sharing the same route, right? If you have two airlines that are exactly the same, um, both of them are not likely to stay in business. They will not coexist if passengers are consistently valuing one airline over the other. In this case, a competitive ability exists. So for example, if you have two airlines flying exactly the same route uh, with exactly the same planes and all of the same perks, but one charges a lot more than the other, um, the one that charges less is likely to stay in business. But a less competitive airline could still persist by offering different routes than its superior counterpart. So that more expensive one could actually offer more convenient routes, say, thereby capitalizing on the different, a different customer base. So that would be a niche difference. Of course, for coexistence, the routes that are offered must be sufficiently different, um, which in ecological language would be expressed as the need for the niche difference to outweigh the difference in competitive ability. Another way you could solve that is by the more expensive airline that was otherwise struggling um, could, for example, offer more perks. It could offer you a luxury experience to then attract a slightly different audience to the cheaper airline. And that's exactly the same idea as what we've been talking about here with rodents and that occurs in ecosystems all the time. So the impact of competitive exclusion, as I've mentioned, and indeed how strong niches are is still debated. And that's because real ecosystems are very complex and these are hard things to quantify. Niches can be differentiated within ecosystems in several ways. They can be uh, differentiated through the resources that um, the org organisms within those niches use, predation, so predators can pick on different groups and a balance between these, or they can be temporal, for example, wet versus dry season specialists. So there's quite a lot of stuff to think about when we're talking about niches, and we will see a bit more detail of that in the next video. So I'll see you there in just a second.